Thank you very much. Uh, fair warning, this is normally a 45 minute talk that I had to cut quite a bit out of to get it f to fit into 30, so I probably won't have time for Q&A, um, but I'm around the rest of the afternoon and all day tomorrow, so just come find me if you wanna talk more about this stuff. Um, so briefly, what we're gonna talk about today, um, we're gonna start with just what are we even talking about? What do I mean when I say mental health and mental illness? Um, then I'll backtrack a little bit and talk more about myself and my reasons for speaking up about this. Um, but then the bulk of the talk is really focused on things that we all can do uh, in our workplaces, in our personal lives to help make this better for everyone. Um, and then finally, there's a short section on the thornier, aspirational stuff that we all really have to do together in order to actually affect change. So what are we talking about? Um, so if there's one thing that I want you all, got, you guys all to walk away from here uh, with today is this statistic, is that one in five US and Canadian adults are living with mental illness at any given time. That is a really big number. That basically means it's one of the most prevalent uh, chronic health conditions in North America. But for some reason, we don't really talk about it. Um, and when I say mental illness, I'm talking about any and all of these. A lot of them you've probably heard about before. Some of them might be new to you. Um, there's also a phenomenon called comorbidity, which is when someone has one of these illnesses, they're also more likely to develop a second. So for example, depression and anxiety often go together, anxiety and ADHD, um, things like that. Uh, there are two on, the, on here on this list that I wanted to kind of call out specially. One is autism spectrum disorders and the other is burnout. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about autism spectrum disorders today because um, while they fall under the big umbrella definition of mental disorders, there's also a lot of things that kind of make them different from most of the other things here. Um, they often require different treatments, different interventions. They pretty much always start from early childhood onwards. Um, they're often associated with things like learning disabilities that need to be targeted in specific ways, whereas most of the rest of these can develop at any given point in a person's life. Um, and the other thing is I work with an organization that is just more focused on all of these, whereas autism spectrum disorders, usually when, when an organization focuses on that, they focus only on that issue. Um, but at the same time, there's still a lot of overlap. There's a lot of things that I'm going to be talking about that are relevant for autism and Asperger's as well. Um, the other thing is burnout, because we're going to be talking about the workplace. This is obviously very relevant, um, and at least in the United States, when the idea of burnout was first introduced in the 1970s, there was a lot of backlash. Um, and people said, like, how can you get sick from working too much? That's a crazy idea. Um, and uh, so I did some research on, like, where are we at in 2017? Um, and actually, nowadays, most psychologists agree that burnout is actually depression. Um, a lot of studies have shown that at the end of the day, the symptoms are almost indistinguishable from one another. But um, burnout is essentially depression with a very specific cause, which is prolonged stress, usually from working too much. So it's still fine to refer to it as burnout. That's totally legitimate. Um, but I figured this is, this is something that most people don't know is that that's what the psycholo uh, psychology community is kind of converging on at this point is that burnout is depression. Um, another interesting about this list is that um, when you say mental illness, a lot of people tend to have a very uh, predefined idea in their minds of what you're talking about, so it's very common for people to immediately jump to something like schizophrenia. Um, but it turns out that depression is probably uh, the most prevalent uh, mental illness, and it's at least 13 times more prevalent than schizophrenia. A big problem with depression in particular is that it's very misunderstood. Um, we usually associate it with specific symptoms like feelings of sadness, uh, loss of interest or pleasure in normal activities, and tiredness and lack of energy. But it turns out that there's actually a whole spectrum of symptoms and emotions you can be feeling when you're depressed. So there can also be uh, angry outbursts and irritability, um, sleep disturbances, which can be insomnia or sleeping too much, uh, any kind of changes in appetite and anxiety, agitation, or restlessness. And in fact, what we're finding over time is that when women are depressed, they are more likely to experience symptoms of uh, the feelings of sadness, loss of interest, and tiredness and lack of energy that we traditionally associate with depression, while men are more likely to have the angry outbursts uh, and anxiety and agitation and restlessness, and so they're also less likely to think that they're depressed and seek treatment for it. Um, and uh, a big issue with the stigma around depression and, and mental illness as well is that we tend to make people feel a lot of shame for feeling this way, especially in North America because we have so many privileges. It's very common for people who are suffering from depression to hear things like, uh, I can't believe you're sad when kids in Africa are starving. 
Uh, and there's a response to this that does the rounds on the internet every couple of months that I think is really powerful, which says that telling someone not to be sad because others have it worse is like telling people they can't be happy because others have it better. Another good illustration of what the stigma is like is from this comic called Robot Hugs, um, called Helpful Advice, and the subtitle here is If Physical Illness Were Treated Like Mental Illness. Um, so just in case you can't read the captions, I'll read them out loud. On the left it says, uh, I get that you have food poisoning and all, but you have to at least make an effort. You just need to change your frame of mind, then you'll feel better. Have you tried, you know, not having the flu? And I don't think it's healthy that you have to take medication every day just to feel normal. Don't you worry that it's changing you from who you really are? It's like you're not even trying. And while lying in bed obviously isn't helping you, you need to try something else. Uh, and all of the stigma and all of this shame has very real consequences because in the United States, as just one example, 56% of US adults with mental illness do not receive treatment. Um, and that's a particularly big problem for those with severe mental illness because, for example, 15% of those with severe depression end up dying by suicide. So when the stakes are so high, you would think that people speak up, but they don't. Um, and the reason why is because of fear. Things like fear of dismissal, fear of being taken out of promotion consideration, fear of being taken off high value projects and contracts, fear of reduced hours for hourly workers, fear of being asked to take unpaid medical leave and just generally a fear of being treated differently. Um, and culturally as well, I think there's this kind of idea that people often encounter, which is like leave your personal life at home when you come to work. Um, but that doesn't work when you're living with mental illness. You don't just shut off your depression or your bipolar disorder or your ADHD for eight hours a day when you go to work and then deal with it again when you're home. For better or worse, we need to start accepting people as whole humans and making sure that our workplaces are accommodating that. So now backtracking a little bit, talking about uh, who I am and why I speak up about this. I legitimately get asked this question a lot because I am a software engineer, I'm not a mental health professional. Um, in fact, I think I've taken a grand total of one psychology class in my entire life. I actually went to art school twice. Um, I also identify as mentally healthy. Um, I've never been diagnosed with a mental health condition. Um, and that makes me a little bit unusual because there are people who talk about this subject because they themselves are living with mental illness and they're trying to raise more awareness uh, for why this is an issue and why we should all be accommodating it better. Uh, and so I'm a little bit of a standout in that community. But the reason why I speak out is because of her. Uh, this is my best friend, Ni. Nee. We met about six years ago when we were both living in New York City. Uh, hit it off right away, um, became very, very close. Uh, she had just moved to New York City from Seattle. Um, she got a web development fellowship. Um, even though she had not studied computer science, she had studied uh, uh, biology and chemistry. Uh, and her parents really wanted her to go to medical school. Um, but she was really interested in design and technology, and uh, so she got this fellowship to basically teach herself the, the, the job um, while she was working. Uh, and she did really, really well. Um, and after about a year and a half, she realized that the place where she had been working, she had done about as much growing as she could do, and she felt like the next best step for her was to move uh, to the San Francisco Bay Area and get a job at a startup. Um, so she did, and obviously I was sad to see her go, but we kept an active touch. Um, but her life in the Bay Area was tough, um, because as someone without a computer science background, she wrestled a lot with imposter syndrome, um, and she had been living her entire adult life with bipolar disorder. Um, and uh, we all thought she was doing better, um, so it really caught us all by surprise when last September uh, she took her own life. So all of this is still really difficult for me to talk about, and so if you really want to know more about that, last year I wrote a really long blog post about it. Um, but in the meantime, like, uh, after kind of processing the grief, I realized I really wanted to do something about this to try to make sure that I didn't lose another friend. Um, and so I got involved in this organization called Open Sourcing Mental Illness, which is founded by this guy on the right, Ed Finkler. Uh, he was always a big part of the PHP conference speakers track. Um, and finally started speaking up about his own experiences living with uh, ADHD and generalized anxiety disorder and how that affected his life uh, working as a software developer. Um, and that resonated with so many people that we basically ended up forming a whole organization around it called Open Sourcing Mental Illness, that's now an official 501c3 nonprofit in the United States. Um, and one big thing that Open Sourcing Mental Illness does every year is called the Mental Health in Tech Survey, where we ask anybody working in tech 
uh, to basically take the survey to help us gauge the attitude towards uh, mental illness and mental health in the tech workplace. Um, and so just in case you didn't believe me when I said there's a stigma, um, there's one thing that always shows up in the survey results every year um, that still really illustrates how much work we have to do. Um, and we always ask this question, do you think that discussing a physical health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? And do you think that discussing a mental health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? And so you can see on the left, uh, the no's basically make up three quarters of the entire pie. Um, but on the right, for the mental health issue, the yeses and maybes make up about two thirds. Um, that's a huge difference. And so like I said, that illustrates how much work we have left to do. Um, so I've stayed involved in OSMI ever since, um, and I would say that honestly my biggest contribution to this community is to try to listen as much as possible um, to people like, it, like Ed uh, when they talk about their experiences and then thinking about what people like me can do to help. Um, and admittedly there are moments when that's kind of tough, um, and there's one thing that Ed said in one of his talks that really resonated with me, uh, which said, uh, I could do so many awesome things if only my own head didn't get in the way. And so the first time I heard him say that, it was incredibly powerful to me because I realized that as a software developer, my entire ability to do my job rests solely in my head. Like, I'm not a construction worker, I don't need muscles, I just need to get up every day and basically take for granted that my head is gonna do exactly what I need it to do. Um, people like Ed don't get to do that. Um, and that's really difficult, and so that's why like I said, I'm basically spending every single day now thinking about what, what I can do um, to try to help make this better. And so that's essentially what I'm gonna share with you. Um, so when I set out on this journey, um, I basically started by just kind of characterizing like what are tech cult workplaces and tech culture really like? What, it, what kind of makes this unique? Um, and so some of the things I came up with were the work is challenging and stressful. Um, our jobs are highly collaborative. It, the whole myth of like the, the coder who sits by himself in a corner I think is, is just that, a myth. Um, many of us have relocated for a job. Most of us work remotely at least part of the time. We're often expected to be available outside work hours and someone needs to fix things when they break overnight. And there's a heavy emphasis on drinking culture. Um, so when I started thinking about all of that, I started thinking about relocation in particular because like I mentioned, uh, my friend Ni nee had relocated from New York City to San Francisco um, because she believed that that was the best thing to do for her career. Um, and so I started thinking, well, you know, like relocation can't be all bad. There have to be some, some positives as well. Um, and so I just started breaking it down like that. So the positives, for example, are it's much easier to feel like you're part of the team and helping toward the mission if you're on site with everyone else. Um, and in this case, it can bring you closer to a community of practitioners in your field compared to where you currently are. But some of the negatives are that it takes someone away from their existing support structures that they have already built up, like your therapist or the friend whose house you can drive to at three in the morning when you really just need to cry. Um, moving is also generally stressful um, and making new friends as an adult is surprisingly hard. So I started thinking about all of that and, and the solutions. Um, and the first one, it's more on the aspirational side, but I really truly believe that as a community, we need to stop saying that the best way to succeed in tech is to relocate to Silicon Valley. Um, we really need to become more accepting of alternative choices. Uh, but more practically speaking, if you are a manager, take another look at your hiring practices and see whether hiring remote employees is an option. Um, and if it's not, if people do have to relocate to join your company, then introduce them to uh, organizations and events in the area, take them, them to your book club and things like that so they can start building up those support structures outside of work. Um, remote work, which I just kind of alluded to a little bit, um, in general I feel like is actually a really positive thing and I've heard anecdotally that that's what draws a lot of people with mental illness to the job in the first place. Um, so on the positive side, it usually kind of implies flexible hours. Um, and if you're living with mental illness, that's a big deal because um, you might want to see a therapist. And it turns out that therapists like to work nine to five, Monday to Friday. So if you want to start uh, attending therapy appointments, you probably need to do that in the middle of the workday. Um, and so if you're working from home, that's easier to do. You also don't have that awkwardness of like your entire team plus potentially seeing you walk out of the office in the middle of the afternoon. Um, and for similar reasons, it also makes it easier to, to stick to medication regimens. Um, it also often makes it easier to take breaks and usually is quiet and peaceful um, unless you have a newborn at home. 
On the negative side, though, um, there's a sense of isolation that builds up after a while, um, and I've heard this a lot because I have a lot of friends who recently went um, into full-time remote employment, um, and all of them were, for the first two or three months or so, were like, oh, this is great. I can't believe I haven't done this my entire life. I love working for my pajamas. Um, this is the best thing ever. Um, and then after that honeymoon phase ends, usually about two or three months in, they're like, this actually really sucks. I feel really lonely all the time. I miss talking to people and just having those random conversations in the middle of the day. Uh, it can also make it harder to build strong relationships with coworkers. Um, and even if you're not living with mental illness, but you just want to be supportive, you really just want to make sure that everyone is taken care of, um, it can make it really hard to tell if everyone's doing okay. Uh, and it can make it more challenging to maintain a work-life balance, especially if you're truly working from home and your home is your office. It just makes it harder to say, like, okay, it's 5 o'clock. I'm going to not check my work email anymore. I'm going to say, like, I'm off for the day. So some of the solutions here, um, the big one is co-working spaces. Everyone who I've talked to has tried this, uh, raves about it. Um, and so I think really the, the way to help speed adoption of these is to make sure that the company makes funds ava available for the employees to join them because there's usually a membership fee. Um, even if there is no money to pay for that long term, at least pay for their first month so that that employee actually checks that out um, and, and considers that as an option. Uh, also, make sure you fly in remote employees or hold company-wide offsites together to make sure that everyone feels like they're part of the team. Uh, and the good news is there's so many people, companies, uh, nonprofit organizations all doing research on uh, remote work culture and how to make it better that you're not the only ones worrying about this. There's tons of research that you can tap into. There's whole conferences now about uh, how to make remote work better, so just check some of those out. Um, if you feel like this is something that your company struggles with, just try two or three new things, and if it doesn't work, try something else and, and see if you can just improve the way that it works. So when I first pitched this talk, um, someone came back to me and said, but what about open plan offices? And so this was interesting to me because this is not something that I had planned to include originally. Um, so I started doing some research and basically uh, the conclusion was, yes, open plan offices are pretty bad, but not just for mental health reasons. Even if mental illness were completely not a thing, I think open plan offices would still be pretty bad. Um, but well, I wanted to give it the same treatment and think about some of the positives. So um, it does make it more conducive to collaboration and creative problem solving between multiple employees if everyone's kind of like in a small space together. I used to think that that's why everyone did it, um, but it turns out that it's actually just easier to construct because of things like fire code, so that's why everyone does it. Um, and it also can increase the sense of team unity and camaraderie, um, but I really want to emphasize the can here because if there's already friction on the team, then it can actually increase the resentment instead. Um, but some of the big negatives, uh, everyone's number one complaint about open plan offices are the noise and how it reduces productivity. Uh, lack of pri privacy is also a big issue, and I think that's really the biggest thing for people living with mental illness. Um, like I said before, the great thing about working from home is that you can duck out for that therapy appointment without necessarily everything, everyone noticing. This is kind of the complete opposite of that. Um, people also usually talk about how they just feel increased stress being in that open space with everyone else, um, and there's also an increased sense of peer pressure. Um, and that can be damaging to mental health as well, because you might get to a point in your workday when you realize you're just not being productive, and the best thing that you could do for yourself is maybe take like a half hour break, go walk around the block or something. Um, but if you're then looking around and you see everyone kind of bent over their desk and working productively, chances are what's going to happen is you're going to talk yourself out of taking that break, um, which is the worst thing that you can do for yourself in that moment. Um, and finally, these are also highly conducive to the spread of physical diseases like the cold, the flu, etc. Uh, so some of the solutions here, um, allow employees to work remotely if you don't already, and if you do, maybe increase the number of days per week or per month when they can do so. Um, also, either way, urge employees to work from home when they're sick. Don't have them bring the cold or the flu into the office. Uh, set aside small meeting spaces for quiet work. I feel like, especially in, in bigger companies like mine, everyone has that one conference room that's like too small to actually have a productive meeting in. Um, so maybe just set that one aside for when people need to take like a, 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 an hour or so to do some quiet work. Uh, have the company provide noise canceling headphones. This is usually like the number one sided solution. Um, that's just kind of an easy quick fix. 
And then finally, encourage employees to decorate their workspace. And that might sound kind of silly, but there's actually been a lot of studies done on this. Uh, there was a 2014 study done in Sweden where they tested different office configurations uh, and basically rated how uh, well or poorly people reacted to them. And the one that was rated most poorly, especially among men, was the open plan flex office, uh, which is an open plan office where not everyone has their own desk. Uh, and in a 2010 study in the UK, they found that uh, they compared people who had uh, decorated and personalized their workspace and people who completely hadn't. Uh, and the people who had decorated their workspaces were one third more productive. Um, and I should also have said up front that my solutions, again, I'm focusing on pragmatic things. Uh, I could go up in here and say we just shouldn't build open plan offices anymore. Um, but I think most of us don't have the power to go back to our companies and pitch that as a solution. Um, so hopefully these are things that you can actually try. Uh, and then alcohol at tech events. Uh, this is another slightly controversial one. Um, I'll just try to run through the positives, although one is kind of a positive negative. Um, but one or two drinks can make it easier for some introverts and those with social anxiety to socialize with their peers. Um, and it's also become an expectation in tech culture. And if you don't offer alcohol, then those who want to drink will go find a bar instead of staying to mingle with others at the event. Um, and so most event organizers that I talk to, this is the number one reason why they won't get rid of the alcohol. Um, but on the negative side, uh, it really makes non-drinkers feel unwelcome. And if you happen to be a recovering alcoholic and alcoholism, uh, substance use disorder is a mental illness as well, um, you're gonna feel really threatened by this kind of environment. Um, and finally, free alcohol and drinking culture are so pervasive that there are probably more functioning alcoholics in tech than we're all even aware of. So some of the solutions here, um, again, I'm trying to be pragmatic. Some, some people would say we should just stop serving alcohol at tech events, um, but I sympathize with the, the, the event organizers who are just uncomfortable with everyone leaving to go, uh, go to a bar instead of staying to network. Um, so some things that have actually worked for different organizers in the past, things like offering nice alternatives, um, like fancy sodas or mocktails um, for non-drinkers to make them feel included. Uh, the number one complaint that I've heard from non-drinkers is like, um, it sucks when everyone is getting really nice uh, cocktails and, and, and drinks, and then there might be some like lukewarm sodas on the side for everyone else. Um, that's really good, uh, a way to make people feel like second-class citizens. Um, also, definitely always put a limit on the number of free drinks, like use some kind of ticket or token system. Um, most event organizers do this for budget reasons, but it turns out to be great for health as well, because the way it usually works is after you have your first two free drinks, then it turns into a cash bar. Um, but what I've seen over time is that uh, people, after they have their two free drinks, they might think about like, should I really take out my wallet and pay for the third? And at that point, they might realize like, actually, I have a pretty good buzz. Maybe I don't need to pay for that third drink. Um, and then there's just less of a risk that they're gonna get drunk and have other health consequences. Um, also, always have activities other than drinking, like for example, board games. It turns out that there's a huge overlap between software developers and people who like playing board games. So you would think that more people would try this, but usually alcohol is like the only entertainment that's there. Um, so this is a tried and true solution. If you have a recurring series of events like a weekly company happy hour or a monthly meetup, maybe just try alternating dry and non-dry events so you don't have to get rid of the alcohol completely, but just you know, try introducing some things in between that don't always have to rely on alcohol being there. And then finally, add workplace well wellness programs on substance abuse. Um, I feel like we always roll our, our eyes at these, but at the end of the day, they have actually been proven to be effective. Um, it turns out that we all just periodically need the reminder that drinking too much is, is bad for our health. Um, you have probably noticed that some of these uh, recommendations are aimed at management, um, but I would say overall, my biggest recommendation to management is leading by example. Um, things like not micromanaging, leaving the office on time, taking regular vacations yourself, not sending or answering emails at 2 a.m. if possible, uh, being receptive to feedback on your own performance in addition to giving people feedback on their performance, uh, being a good listener, and then finally, the only thing that's really specific to mental health is uh, try to be open to talking about your health and mental health, because your goal really should be to try to make people feel comfortable coming up to you and talking about their problems, but they not, might not feel comfortable doing that unless you've opened up a little bit about some of the things that you might have struggled with in the past. 
Um, so as scary as it might sound to be that vulnerable, uh, that it should really just be your goal to try to make everyone feel safe talking to you. And, and leading by example is the best way to do that. Some other action items for managers, uh, make sure your employees understand their benefits. Um, so for example, uh, pay time off for medical reasons, making sure people realize that you can use sick days for mental health as well. Um, and there might be long-term disability options as well. Uh, revisit your hiring practices with an eye to mental illness and neurodiversity, and I'll talk more about neurodiversity in a little bit. Make sure your employees feel valued in our own projects that they find fulfilling and empowering. Um, and this might, again, sound like it has nothing at all to do with mental health, but the thing I've noticed in my time with OSMI uh, has been that um, when people feel like they're, they're kind of backsliding, that they're falling back into their, their depression, um, it's usually because something changed at work. Um, it's because they got put on a new project where they feel like the goals aren't clear, management's not listening, no one's being transparent about the goals, uh, there's like unrealistic deadlines, that sort of thing. Um, so making sure that people are, are on projects that they're happy to work on um, is actually really important for mental health as well. Uh, get the OSMI handbooks. They are available on OSMI's webpage, but you can also go directly to LeanPub. Um, two of them are more geared towards American audiences. They talk about ADA law and how they protect people with mental illness. So those might not be as relevant if you're in Canada, but the third one talks about how to start a mental wellness program in your workplace, and that was, would be a good one for anyone to check out. Um, and then finally, consider offering the mental health first aid training. So mental health first aid is basically, uh, people have said it's sort of like the mental health equivalent of teaching someone CPR. Uh, the whole idea is teaching someone how to respond if, if they notice that someone is having a mental health crisis of some kind. Um, it's an international program. In Canada, it's 12 hours. In the US, it's eight hours. Um, and one really good thing that companies can do to help reduce the cost of taking this course is actually bringing in a trainer to teach the course in your workplace. Um, it's also often been suggested that maybe if you don't teach it to, ever, to um, all of your employees, at least have management and C-level execs take the course. Um, so then it teaches them to be more empathetic and thinking more about uh, mental health issues as well. And so now very quickly, I'll run through some of this, the, the difficult aspirational stuff that we all have to do together. The first one is making sure that we always support marginalized people in tech um, because chronic harassment, bullying, and micro microaggressions can lead to depression, exacerbate eating disorders, and cause or worsen other mental illnesses. Um, and people are, are always surprised when I mention eating disorders uh, in the context of tech um, because they're like, well, we're not actors, we're not models. But it turns out that even in tech, women are still judged by their appearance. It's not uncommon, especially in the Bay Area, to hear things like, oh, well, you only got that interview because you're pretty. Um, and in general, people from marginalized groups feel like they have to overperform because there's this whole myth of uh, lowering the bar to let these people into tech. Um, and that leads to increased stress and a greater likelihood of burnout. Another thing is embracing neurodiversity. So this neurodiversity is the idea that mental disorders like ADHD and autism are the result of natural variations of the human genome. Um, and they say that people with differences do not need to be cured, they need help and accommodation instead. Uh, so this is a little bit controversial because the strongest proponents of neurodiversity are actually saying that we should stop looking for a cure for autism altogether and just focus on accommodations. I'm not quite willing to go that far, um, but at the same time, I'm enough of a pragmatist to realize that um, even if we do find a cure for autism, it's probably too late for this generation. Um, so in the meantime, there's a whole generation of people living with autism spectrum disorders who still deserve to live happy and productive and healthy lives. Um, and so we should be accommodating them better. And it's in our interest as well because some of our greatest inventions are attributed to people with atypical neurology. Ed Finkler himself likes to talk about how uh, his ADHD gives him superpowers, how he notices connections and comes up with solutions that other people haven't thought of before. Uh, and there was this great article in the Harvard Business Review for May uh, entitled Neurodiversity as a Competitive Advantage uh, that basically found the same thing. They followed some companies that are part of this program where they're explicitly hiring people on the autism spectrum. And they found that these people, like, just like Ed, were basically coming up with solutions no one had thought of um, and, uh, and performing really well. But the biggest hurdle to getting them in was literally just getting them into the company in the first place. The whole interview system was set up so that these people without this program would never have been hired. Uh, and finally, again, just a few things that we can only change as a culture. 
uh, working ourselves to death, the overemphasis on hard work and stigma against vacation and healthy breaks, the whole idea that you need to be coding on the weekends and on your vacation in order to be a good programmer, uh, the need to always be available by phone or email, uh, peer pressure caused by social media. There's a lot of studies now saying that Facebook use tends to worsen people's depression because everyone only posts about the good things that happen to them and not the bad things. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the belief that you must be in Silicon Valley to succeed. Uh, the stigma against talking about our feelings and the idea that engineers don't have empathy. Uh, this last one is not something that I had thought was really a thing, um, perhaps because I went to art school, uh, but someone else mentioned this to me, that she was basically told that she couldn't use the word empathy when talking to programmers because they all believe that they don't have it. Um, and I strongly disagree with that. I think empathy is something that we all have the capacity for, but we just need to explicitly choose to exercise it. Um, and from that same presentation that this woman gave, there was a, a quote that she had that I thought was very powerful and very fitting, which is, empathy is the antidote to shame. And she was talking about this in the context of the shame and blame culture of tech, um, but I think it really is relevant to mental health as well, because shame, if you really think about it, is the stigma. And so empathy is the antidote. And so that brings me back to my talk title, Empathy as a Service. Hopefully you picked up on this by now that it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, there is no app for this. We can't deploy to the cloud. We can't automate it away. Uh, again, this is something that we all have to explicitly choose to exercise for ourselves and for each other. And if you're struggling with trying to figure out how to do that, again, I bring you back to this quote by Ed Finkler. Um, that really helped me kind of wrap my head around um, how I needed to be thinking about this, which is I could, I could do so many awesome things if only my own head didn't get in the way. Uh, so I'm basically out of time, but I'll post my slides online. They have these great resources, so feel free to ask me if you have any questions about this, and feel free to get in touch or come find me after if you want to talk about more of this. So thank you very much.